Hi, welcome to the signal pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Agilent 8163A, a light wave multimeter. It's an unusual instrument. It's, as the name suggests, it has to do something with optical measurements. It accepts different kinds of modules here in the front, and these modules can do anything from tunable lasers, various types of lasers, or on the receiving side, power meters and peak power detectors, and so on and on. So it can become quite powerful if you're doing some kind of an optical measurement, especially in the optical communication or physics, for instance. Now this one doesn't work, and because it's a special instrument, they are quite expensive, but thanks to my Patreon supporters, we can buy these and experiment with them, and hopefully, if we can fix it, I do have modules that we can try in, and then before we can do some experiments, hopefully at the end as well. I'm gonna turn it on and see what happens. Here we go. So the fan sounds really bad, so it's obviously been running for a very long time. Those bearings need some attention, and that's all it does. It goes through this flickering, and it tries to boot, and it just doesn't go anywhere. So there's a few things right off the bat that could be wrong with it. It could be the power supply, for example, doesn't have the right voltages, so the processor can't completely boot. It could be that there's something wrong with the firmware, or maybe even the processor is damaged. Either way, some of those may not be repairable, but nonetheless, we get to play around with it and see what's wrong with it. So let's take it apart. Now, despite the fact that this was completely broken, it came with all the bumpers and even the handle. That's a good sign, typically, because usually when these things, people give up on them and the recycling companies get a hold of them, they take these because they're quite useful for other instruments. So the fact that it's all together was one of the reasons I thought I would buy it. And even on the back, the interlock 50 ohm resistor that actually comes off, that's even still attached to the instrument. It's a really good sign. So here's the instrument opened up. This is the top of the instrument actually, and it looks like it's going to be quite difficult to service because it's really enclosed. So if you look at the bottom of it, there's actually no room here, and these plates do not come off. These are the other side, so they're not accessible from this side, unfortunately, which means we're going to have to put quite a bit of effort to see if we can get to the inside of it and where the power supply is. This back has to come off to access the fan, but I think we should be able to remove this board and see what's underneath it. On this side, you can't really see much. There's a really large connector here, which is maybe for some factory testing or so on. Uh, you can, there's a battery and a real-time clock area here and some memory, but really all the fun stuff's on the other side. So let me see if I can take it apart. So here's the board from the top now. Now let's take an overall view on it and see how it operates. So on one side, it connects with these two ribbon cables to the front display. Display has its own Epson controller, which controls the LCD screen. And one of these ribbon cables is for the buttons and the other one for sending the data. It can actually be that the front panel display is the problem, and it, maybe the whole thing is booting and then just this part isn't working, or maybe there's just a simple problem with the connectors. We have to take a look at that separately. There's one little fan over here in an unusual place because this fan, when you close this up, I mean, it's right up against that display. And it probably is because there is a component here that's not populated. And maybe this one has a little heat sink and this just blows across the heat sink. I'm not sure, but then why wouldn't you just put it on top of the heat sink? Anyway, it's a strange little fan there out of nowhere. Battery here, supercapacitor backup probably for changing and maintaining some state so you don't lose everything. And then over here we have an AMD Elon SC300. This is an x86 compatible processor, which means you can run DOS and low-level Windows operating systems on this. So it's quite complex and intended to run maybe some heavy software. Going back here, a couple of components. Here are probably firmware, some more memory and so on. We have a Xilinx here. The Xilinx FPGA connects directly to this bus, it looks like. Oh, let me go a little further. And this bus is the only way this board connects to everything else in this unit. In fact, the power also comes through here, and the connection to the modules also comes through here. So it has to be sandwiched inside the chassis, making it very difficult to work on. Well, we'll see how that plays out. There's an NI here, it's probably a GPIB controller. A lot of other connectors and so on that are not used in this unit, probably this is a platform for a much more complicated set of instruments. So first thing first, let's make sure that this power supply can actually provide the rated power under some loads. I've removed it completely from the instrument, of course. We can connect it to back to the BK Precision DC load, and we can run it directly from the GW Instec APS1102 as an isolation transformer, essentially. And we can see if it works. So this is a quad output power supply, plus 5 volts, plus 15, 24, and minus 15. We really only need to test the positive power supplies because those are the most likely what are involved in the processor and all the digital stuff anyway. So we can test those. So let's go ahead and turn it on. It's under full input AC line. There you go, 5 volt. It looks good, but of course this is under no load. Let's put it under a, you know, some serious load. and it's, it's rated for much more than 5 amps, so we should be able to try that 5 amps. And let's see. There we go, no problem, it gives you 5 amps, no worries, there's some drop on these cables of course, but 4.6 with the cable drop looks pretty good. Okay, let's turn this off. The next output should be uh, 15 volts, and I think that's somewhere around here. There you go, there's 15 volts, this one cannot supply as much current, so we're going to try, let's say, 3 amps instead. Turn this one on as well. 
no problem 43 watts again there's going to be some drop but it looks good and then finally we have plus and plus 24 volts at the very end we we'll test this too even though it's really not going to be important in this case but here's our one amp over here no worries 23 watts being developed uh, into the DC load so the power supply works okay so here's my new setup here so what I had to do was to remove that interface port from the instrument itself this is where the back of those modules will be plugged into if you had had them going from the front panel essentially and this carries power and everything this cable is really short so this kind of has to sit in an angle it's not that great to set up but it is reasonably well protected the AC line coming over here from the isolation transformer the reason I had to do this so that we can probe everything we can see the interaction between the processor and perhaps the firmware we can take a look and see if anything you know is wrong in terms of the power supplies on this board I also looked at the manual a little bit and it says that in order to update the firmware you have to hold a few buttons in the front panel and wait for a beep to come on and that beep is always supposed to be there when the instrument is booting and the buzzer is over here it's not inside the inside the kind of the front panel so that means that these are a little bit separate from each other and as long as we don't hear anything there is something definitely wrong so it's not getting to that booting section now I cleaned everything because there was a lot of dust on it but let's see what happens if you power it on and this way we can basically replicate the problem outside of the instrument there we go I think everything's plugged in it should come directly into the where it was before there you go you can see the backlight turning on oh wait a second it made the beeping noises it didn't do that before Oh, give me a break it's booting I that's annoying so I don't know what happened it may be that because I shifted things around it's not booting again ah, that's kind of annoying I was hoping to be able to do a whole bunch of testing on this board now I did reset these connectors I wonder if it is communicating with this board and if it wasn't getting any response it wasn't going forward anymore ah, that's that's unfortunate okay well let's see where, how far it gets oh it's still booting it's long time well you reached all the way here it says the modules are not in there of course there's nothing in there I can't believe it booted let me reset it one more time try it a couple of times see if I can make that fail again well I tried turning it on and off a few more times yeah it, it's, it, it's not booting and interesting enough all that fan noise is actually from this little fan it's a tiny one it's not even from the one on the back so I guess at this point I'll just clean everything put it back together at least we can do some experiments with it now I like the design of this brushless fan, it's a little bit different in order to achieve a very low profile. So this coil over here, by combining this controller here, can create magnetic fields in different corners of it. And this is of course the brushless system, which means that you need a permanent magnet around it. And normally what we see is that we see the coils in the middle and a cylinder of a permanent magnet around it, or vice versa. But in this case the magnet is totally flat. And when I move this around it, I can actually feel the different poles of this magnet uh, being distributed on the surface of this disc. So when you put this together, of course, you sequentially change the field and then allows the fan to rotate. And uh, because of this, it gives it a really low profile. It's kind of interesting. So all I have to do is basically get an appropriate lubrication into this little bearing, and then that should remove the sound of this, and hopefully it will go back to normal. Well, our repair wasn't very interesting, but nonetheless, we can take a look at two of these modules and try it out in our instrument that's now working. So first one is the 81635A. This is an indium gallium arsenide dual channel power meter. So you can put fiber optic into these. And this is sensitive from 800 nanometer to 1650, which is quite broad and covers a lot of different standards. So we should be able to see if this is working using this other module. This is an 81654A. This is a dual Febri Perot laser operating at two different wavelengths, 1310 and 1550. Both of them are, of course, in the infrared region. So you're not going to be able to see anything with the naked eye. But we can put this into a wavelength meter, verify that it is indeed producing both of the Febri Perot frequency combs and we can even loop it back into this one and measure the power out of the laser so lots of cool things to try but since we didn't do you know a very exciting repair I'm also going to take these apart just to show you what's on the inside so here's inside our dual detector and if you look on the right side you can see the individual detectors here and they're individually serial numbered and so on and calibrated in factory custom made of course and the connections the three connections from each of those detectors goes directly onto the PCB now, the architecture of this PCB, the function is really straightforward. So what you need to do is you need to bias these photo detectors. And depending on how much energy, how much photons is coming into it, the bias condition has to change. And then those photons will be converted to electrons and then produce some current. And you're interested in measuring that current. So there's a complex loop going on here where there is some biasing applied and some measurements being made at the same time. 
And because these diodes are measuring a huge dynamic range of optical power, something in order of 90 to 100 dB of change, that's a huge amount. So you need some ranging, of course. And it looks like that some of that ranging is done using relays as opposed to purely in solid state, probably just to maintain linearity and excellent isolation and so on. So if you look here, there are two digital to analog converters. These are two 12-bit DACs that's probably used for biasing and so on. And there are two Berberounds 16-bit analog to digital converters as well. That's probably used for readback. This is how any actual optical front-end receiver would look like. Well, of course, without the ADCs and DACs at these speeds. But in general, you bias them and then you digitize the data using a transient pin amplifier. So that's probably what's going on overall here. And it's a fairly complex and sensitive analog design. It has to be very carefully calibrated. There's also a switch here that you, it's not connected to anything in the front, which is interesting. Maybe something in the factory. That's what it's used for. Then there's a gap in the PCB, and everything on the other side is essentially digital. All this stuff is for interfacing to the other instrument. And it seems so heavy. There's so much stuff going on here. There's a full microprocessor, Xilinx, FPGAs, interface ICs, and so on. And it seems very excessive for this particular module, but that's probably because this is a common platform used for maybe much more complicated modules. That's probably why it looks like the way it does. But yeah, overall, structure really straightforward, uh, quite sensitive and nice analog design. We can go over, you know, reverse engineer it step by step, but the overall functionality is fairly clear. So let's look at the laser. And here's inside our dual Fabry Pearl laser module. And it's covered, of course, at the top with the plastic holding all of the fibers in line. It may look really complicated and so many fibers. And the reason is because fiber couplers and patches and so on typically are sold with a certain amount of fiber attached to them. And you usually don't cut them. So you end up with a lot of long fiber. This is normal and very common if you open communication devices using fiber optics. So here's our output. That's the white fiber here. If you look at the white fiber, it just loops around, ends up here in this patch. So it basically couples this white fiber into the green fiber. Now, this is just a casing, of course. All, all internally, they're all the same fiber. And this coupling has to be done very carefully with very low loss. And these are done with special machines. And typically, the coupling losses are tiny. So most of the energy is, is brings out from the other side of the fiber. And then if you look at that green one, it wraps around for a while and reaches here, and this is actually a combiner. So in an electromagnetic term, it's essentially a coupler, but this is a fiber coupler. It does it with light, and there's two outputs out of it. You can see these two. And these two outputs then loop around, and they come back over here, and they patch again into two white fibers. And that's because when you buy these components, you buy this coupler. It comes with this green fiber and these two colors on the other end. That's one component. And then you get your laser diodes. Here's one Fabry Perot. Here's another Fabry Perot underneath. Those come out with white fibers. Those are these two. And you come over here and you patch those two into here. And then eventually you patch it to the pigtail at the end of this output. So yeah, that's why it looks so complicated. Really, it's very simple. They're just combining the output of two Fabry Perot lasers into one fiber. Now, these Fabry Perot laser modules internally have feedback loops and so on, and they even have techs to stabilize them and measure how much power is coming in. There's a lot of analog loops running underneath, but it's essentially exactly the same as the other one. In terms of how it works, you can even see the FPGA right through here. Now, I don't want to remove this. I might be able to actually maybe move it. It's a bit of a pain to deal with these fibers because you don't want to pull them. You can damage things, actually. So if I remove it, you can see underneath the two lasers. They want to pull too much. But look, you see the same platform in the back. As I was saying that this is very common. They're just reusing it over and over again. We have again DAX and ADCs to power these modules. They're sitting on some thermal pad at the bottom because there's a tech inside to keep them temperature stable. And it has even has the same switch in the front. Oh, I get it what this switch is for. Okay, the platform is so common that this switch is the enable switch of the laser in the front. So even that is popular than on the other ones. So they really are reusing many things. So now that we understand kind of how this one works, I can close it back. And then we can put it back in the instrument and do some fun measurements with them. OK, things are looking good. So the instrument has detected both of the modules. We're looking at the state of the laser here. So we're looking at only at 1305.5. So we're only activating one of the Fabry Perot lasers. We're going to put that through a couple of different instruments so we can see what it looks like. Now we can change the wavelength, of course. We can create 1305, or we can do both of them at the same time, or we can just have one of them, and so on. So there's many different options here that we can explore. But at 1305, we should be able to see all the Fabry Perot lines. OK, so here at the bottom, we have the HP 86120B. This is a wavelength meter. This is a multi-wavelength meter, so you can measure different wavelengths at the same time and display them. And the top is the Onritsu MS9710A. Both of these instruments are the ones that I've repaired previously on the website. So we're going to use them. I've already connected the fiber to this. On the other end of the fiber, 
we're going to connect to the multi-wavelength meter and of course always always have to clean the fiber between every use it's a lot easier to clean the fiber than it is to fix the connector later there we go so let's go ahead and plug this in here very carefully treating the fiber and there we go okay let's enable the laser and see if it works enable ah look at that look at all these uh, wavelengths that we're seeing let's take a look and here we, are, we can see all of the different February Pro modes and tones coming out. So the peak tone is at 1306.5 nanometer. It should really be at 1305.5 nanometer. And I think the laser may need some calibration. We're putting at minus 6 dBm at that wavelength there. And you can see all the different wavelengths. This is normal for a February Pro. And if I go under the graph, you can see the cluster of all those tones with the mean in the middle, which is how the February Pro primary tone is appearing that looks like this and this is not a spectrum analyzer so you're not going to see the individual tones there they're really close to each other but we can use the Anritsu to see it now I can also go and change the laser and I can turn on both the Febri Pro modules at the same time and then what we expect to see is two different clusters of tones and here's both of them look at that here's the 1305 one and here's the 1541 one if I go back you should see the two main tones the 1543 and the 1306 are the primary main tones of the Febri Perot. That's exactly what we would expect to see. But it's going to look pretty cool on the spectrum analyzer as well. All right, same situation, but this time only the 1305.5 on the Andritsu. Let's turn it on. And let's wait a second for this to sweep. Now, optical spectrum analyzers can be quite a bit slower, but look, we're already seeing it go up. Those are many, many tones of the Febri Perot, many of the modes, but it's going to eventually have a main peak and then it will drop down. It's very common again. There it is. And hopefully at the end it's going to show us the peak value. It should be 1306 if I'm not mistaken. We're very close to it. There you go, 1306 at the very top. So the power is correct and the wavelength is roughly correct, which means that most likely the laser needs to be calibrated. Now we can change the span to a much, much smaller value. Let's say to 10 nanometer. And in this case you would be able to see the individual modes as well fairly clearly. There you go. Here are all the different modes of the laser. And the peak should be 1306.02 nanometer. Very nice. That's exactly what we would expect to see. So I'm quite happy with the laser. Now we can measure the detector. Now in order to test the power sensor inputs, we just simply loop from the laser output directly into it. That's going to give us a, a nice measurement since we already know what kind of output power we're expecting from the lasers. We measured it from two different instruments and they were agreeing with each other. Now if you look over here at the top, you can see that this is below minus 100 dBm. That's the channel where the fiber is attached, this one. And the other one, you can see this sitting at around minus 96 dBm. So why is that? Well, that's because this one has a little cap on it. And that cap is a little bit transparent to the wavelengths that sensor is sensitive to. So if I just cast a shadow on it with my hand, look at that. You can see how, you know, how about a tiny, tiny amount of power that is. The difference between minus 95 dBm and minus 100 dBm is very, very small in absolute value of power. It's also very impressive because this is a single mode fiber input, which means the amount of light coupling into it is very, very small, of course, as to be expected. So the sensors are definitely working. Extraordinary dynamic range on them. So let's go ahead and turn on the laser. There we go. Let's see what we get. There you go, 0.2 dBm. Now, 0.2 dBm is obviously higher than the minus 6 dBm we saw, but the minus 6 dBm was for only one of the tones of the Febri Pro. All the other modes are being integrated at the same time. This is a power sensor, and it works exactly the same way as an RF power sensor. It's just integrating all the power together. Which means if I go over here and enable both lasers at the same time, we should see this power almost double. There we go. Look, I got 3.8 dBm. Indeed, it doubled. That's the power of the 1541 nanometer laser was a little bit higher, so it was a little bit more than double, but it works perfectly fine, exactly what we would expect. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, the repair itself wasn't very interesting. You know, I don't choose what's wrong with the instruments. That's just luck, of course. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we did a lot of other experiments. We took apart these modules and see how they work. We did some interesting optical measurements, and hopefully you found that interesting as well. Thanks always to the Patreon supporters. You make all of this possible. All of these instruments that I've repaired in the previous videos are essentially all from the same sources, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the comment section, and I hope I can make another repair video with more interesting things in the future.